You're listening to Cards to the Moon, a podcast about trading cards from both a collector and investor perspective. We hope you'll stick around for the ride as we take a deep dive into the state of the hobby, share some hot takes, hopefully some useful advice and fun stories along the way. Hey all, welcome back to Cards to the Moon. We're glad you can join us for episode 61. My name is Clark from Five Card Guys on Instagram. And joining me as always is Hyung of Integrity Sports Cards and John who is trade you at Recess. All right, so off the top, not sure if you heard the recent news that eBay is now launching its own vault service, but here are some key details. The eBay vault is a 31,000 square foot facility in Delaware, probably for tax reasons, where like all the vault services currently offered by other competitors, such as PWCC and Golden, the vault can store valuable trading cards for owners. And then also uh, they have the option for sellers to sell and ship them out directly from the vault. The cards are also insured, of course, and kept safe from the elements. And if you remember any cards bought on eBay worth over $750 are now already getting authenticated or making they're getting checked over that's legit by PSA and it's now being digitally imaged as well, which we discussed in a previous episode of this pod. Now, after that step, instead of the card being sent to you directly, you have the option now of just storing it in their vault until, until you want to sell it again. So what do you guys think about eBay now entering the vaulting business and would you ever use their vault? <laughs> oh man, eBay! Good <laughs> God, lower your Having fees. Them, uh... That's all I want. I don't want no vault services. Love hate relationship with eBay. Yeah, I just want lower <laughs> lower fees. You know, um, it just feels like uh, it was inevitable. But another vault service is is typical, right? And I think we they chatted highlight... a, bit, a bit about this before, right? Those like, like I, I believe like broke. PWCC, right? Um, Mm-hmm. Anyways, yeah, and, and and the vault service, I think it has a clientele uh, for it, but like I personally wouldn't use their service. Uh, I could see the the lure in it because even if you transfer ownership, so if I have a card and then let's just say I sell it to you, right? You could leave it in the vault, and there's no there's no really uh, I guess tax. There's just like a processing fee as well, right? So there's stuff like that where you eliminate the shipping and worry about the cards. It's a it's a protective facility and whatnot and all that. But like I said, it's it's something I think you're missing a big part of cards itself is right. ha- actually having the slabs in hand, right? So. I know it's uh it's safe for some and a lot of people worry about like security and you know shipping. Shipping is now a big concern with some people. You just see a lot of, you know, nightmare um, mm-hmm. you know, stories with with shipping cards and insurance trying to, you know, collect insurance from that. So I do believe there is a there is a market for it with that said, you know, I think it's going to be definitely more for a long-term investment purpose, you know, and I, I sell on eBay too. So I, I ship out a lot to some, you know, PWCC vaults and other vaults that, um, mm. you know, uh, especially like overseas international, um, you know, buyers, uh, right. Right. And I think that's makes where, sense. yeah, that's where it really makes sense. And, um, I guess if I lived overseas and I was dealing with, you know, um, the the logistics of bringing thousands of dollars of slabs into my country, um, you know, across the world, that would kind of be almost an issue with even people shipping it out. Like a lot of people don't ship, uh, you know, outside the U.S. and Canada. So, um, especially from the like the eBay side, right? So mm-hmm. I think I think there's a lot of value, but like I said, to each their own. Um, it's definitely something that I wouldn't use just because you know I I like to have the slabs in hand. But uh, yeah. I definitely could see the use for it. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not obviously... As a true collector, I want my cards in my hand. So number one, it doesn't necessarily appeal to me. Um, but I could understand if, let's say, I'm playing in the space of owning five-digit cards, six-digit cards, seven-digit cards... Mm-hmm. Not only that, I am somebody that may be pretty well known 
in the industry. Like I have a big social media following or like, you know, somebody happens to know where in some sort of approximation I might live. Um, right. You know, like, so let's say you're a celebrity collector or whatever. Right. I think in those instances, uh, it, it can make sense in terms of your security. Um, but for me, who is an absolute nobody who doesn't own any <laughs> massively expensive cards, um, it's obviously it, this kind of service obviously doesn't cater, cater to me. But then at the same time, I could understand uh, people are not necessarily collectors and just strictly investing. It could also be very uh, attract, you know, attractive service for those folks, right? Kind of like um, Clark, how you said what was so attractive about you know tops. Um, which I call it like the NFTs, right? Is that it's, there's a there's a platform right. you sell it. You don't have to worry about shipping. You don't have to worry about damage, something getting lost. It's it's, it's you're kind of trying trying to mimic that space, right? So um, I think if you're like purely invest investment, um, something like that, you know, it could definitely uh, appeal to you. But for me, I want my slabs in my hand, right? Like I, I you buy cards because you <laughs> want it. You want it in your collection. You want to look at it. Maybe you get bored and you sell it eventually, but at least for the time being, you want to, you want to look at it, right? So, yeah, I think we're all in the same boat. Like we're all true collectors at heart. We want the slabs in our hands, but um, like you guys both said, uh, it's not a silly idea. Like it for me, it's like why did eBay take so long to provide this service? Obviously, there will be people, investor types that would love to use this service, and even for um, you know, Hyung, you mentioned international, but even for Canadians. Like us, you know what I mean? Like sometimes it's a pain to get it across the border. And um, this could be a viable option for bigger cards, like you were saying, John, to just keep it in a secured vault. And then um, uh, if you're just doing it for investment purposes anyway, yeah, you don't um, have that desire to hold in your slabs. You might as well just keep it there. And then just with a few clicks of the button, you could just sell it just as easily, right? Or even ship it from there to like an auction house. Right. And then you don't have to worry about insurance and, right. you know, uh, safety and all these other things that you got to think about now if you wanted to do that on your own. So, so yeah, it's, uh, I guess it was just a matter of time. But, um, yeah, just kind of, it's good to provide that perspective for, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are like us. We're true collectors, <laughs> probably won't use it, but I'm sure I, there'll I, be a. I wonder if there's a digital space in that. Like the, we talk about NFTs and stuff where you could still enjoy the card, but, you know, have it elsewhere. But there's some kind of, anyways, this, that was just yeah. so random. Like there, there might be one day, like a digital <laughs> aspect of it where I could somewhat enjoy my card, right? Right. You know? So. Or like, um, yeah, like from a. No, I was going to mention that too, but um, this just seems like a logical next step, like for, for vaulting to get into the NFT space. Like, right. you know, instead of eBay or PWCC or Golden keeping track of who owns um, what card in their vault, right? you give the owner or the collector that actually owns it their NFT right. that proves that you own the card. And then you could display that M- NFT to, you know, to your friends. You know, right. like it, it could sound silly, like, oh, here, check out my digital image. But I feel like the next generation, like our the kids, be, you know, after us, they won't really care about a lot of physical assets anymore. Right. You know, it's just like, sense. here, um, look, look at what I have on my phone. And then they're like, oh, is this real? And then there's a way to authenticate that what they're showing you is, yeah, real, like NFT technology. Right. So, you know we'll probably sound like old people just talking about like, Oh, back in the day we used to have these slabs in hand, <laughs> you know, like I can already picture that right now yeah. with my two boys, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's just inevitable. Like you bring that up. That's just gonna, just gonna be the reality for, right. Right. for yeah. our future collectors. Um, but anyway, yeah, it's interesting. They took this long. That's the one big thing for me. Why did they take this long to offer a service? That's, you know, they have a, such a huge market share. They're just letting other companies do it first. Um, maybe eBay's just a bit slower than others. Because they're still working on lowering their fees. <laughs> that, you're going to wait a long time, Hyung. You're going to wait fees, a long time. Gonna, I feel like they're bringing out all these different services to justify their high fees. Oh, man. We're, yeah, we're paying. This is this is taxation at its finest. We're paying for that, that facility probably. Yeah, totally. <laughs> the next service they're going to offer you is not uh, lowering their fees. It's going to be like triple padded envelopes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh boy. All right, we'll see how this all plays out soon enough. Let's move on then now to hobby headlines. So for today's episode, continuing on the theme of what to do in a bear market, we've been saying that there could be some really interesting plays or good buys to be made with so many of these cards down in value. You know, there's a tendency to sell to cut your losses, which actually could be a good move for some of your cards, like your base cards. But what I want to focus on today is like some of the risky plays that you're thinking of doing in the hobby that you could see like a big upside in the future whenever the hobby rebounds along, hopefully along with the economy. So yeah, just want to, you know, throw it out there. Any ideas what you you're thinking of doing? I mean, we, we touched, we touched about it a a bit. I think last week's episode, like for me, I believe we're, we're heading into a recession and it's, it's not all doom and gloom. It's, I mean, we're feeling the pain of, you know, um, what's happening here with, with, the enormous amounts of inflation and how worthless our dollar is becoming. Right. So, but with, with every recession, there comes opportunity. Right. So Mm. I think it's, it's like I said, it's time to, you know, stack cash and make, make the moves that you feel is a good long-term move. Because I think what usually happens um, is this recessions usually shake people off. So you'll, you'll see the flippers, they're going to leave the space. They've already left the space because right, right. It, it doesn't make sense for them, right? Um, and as as they leave, I believe there's a lot of correctness that needs to happen. Um, I think there's value in a lot of, you know, those superstar type players that are on the trajectory of having Hall of Fame careers, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, for me... I think that's uh, a move that I'm going to start making is, you know, kind of get rid of the inflated hype price of all these young stars for the most part. Not saying like for me, I still believe in like the Acunias and Tatis and Sotos. I think long term, you're going to be fine with them, especially like the higher end cards. I don't think people are going to be selling them during this time. There's no point, right? You just kind of enjoy, enjoy those higher end cards. But like I said, the 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 base stuff the stuff that really doesn't have true value when when you talk about sheerly supply demand especially yeah. in a bear market you're going to see that there's absolutely zero demand in some of the lower lower end cards and uh for me uh, as as it gets worse you know um you can't just play defense all the time this is the time where you know what it's not necessarily timing the market but it's going to get lower and lower and there's going to be more buying opportunities as time goes by in the next 12 to 24 months so for me that's where i stand i know we talked about this um a little bit last uh week but it's it happens in uh, similar markets that's why i i I say it's no different in even in the card market because there there is a physical asset component to it and there is value a lot of value in some of these cards still and there is a huge potential in a, a lot of the card space still. Um, but that doesn't mean that this is all going to go doom and gloom. Right. So, Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think you're just really trading off, uh, you know, uh, somewhat of a physical asset for a worthless, worthless cash at this time. Right. So yeah, get ready to buy. I I would say, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, I don't know about risky, but I think we've, I mean, we've always been talking about the goat, type players and low pop low numbered cards this is is essentially exactly why i went for that sort of update refractor it's a card normally that i could couldn't afford um, but i think right now is a time to target those types of cards and i'm talking like the main characters in whatever segment that you're in so if you're into like you know modern vintage for baseball like a good great one is like Barry, the we just talked about it like Barry Bonds, um, uh, the tops traded to Tiffany right, uh, the prices on that is low like Soto, uh, Acuna Tatis, um, you know if you wanted to get into Pokemon like Charizard, you know F one Lewis Hamilton, like target the goats in hockey Wayne Gretzky Lemieux Gordy Howe, etc cetera, etc. Cetera. I think now is the time to move off of every other little play that you had. You're like, Mm -hmm. you got your Darius Garland's and you got your, these and you're, you're banking (laughs) on this guy to play well right now. And then, you know, get for me, like get off of all that 
and while we're in this bear market get into like low pop goat type because when the market rebounds those will be the ones that take off first and foremost um and then you can you know if let's say it's a card you get bored of or you don't want it anymore or all of your cash is in this one card that's when you can sell it off and start getting back into some of your smaller plays and risky plays and Tyrese Maxis of the world. Um, you, you can get back into that. But I think for me, for me, I believe I think, in Maxi. But anyways, <laughs> yeah, I believe right now is not the time to really go after these sort of like sports sure. plays and like thinking about prospects and their futures and stuff like that. I, for me, I would rather start to move my money and put it, start to clump it into some goat style, low population cards. Uh, and then just sit on it, sit on it for six to 12 months and uh, let's see what happens to the market overall and the world overall and then come back into it in a bit. No, it totally makes sense to me. I was going to mention that too. Like I'm targeting GOAT players, numbered cards of GOAT players, right? But you know, like when the when the hobby is like, you know, when it was so hot and then we're right. all saying like, oh man, I wish I could afford that card. And then, you know, when the hobby's not doing as well and then now, you know, like the, you've, the target price is there for you. Right. Why is it that we can't pull the trigger anymore? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you're like, oh, I don't know if I want to do go, that anymore. It, it, it might go down a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think it will. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think but, we could see it go down a lot further. Sure. Is it, but I mean, it's impossible to time the market, right? We, right. 100%. We all know that exactly. truth as well. Yeah. And, you know, like how many times have we been burned? Like, oh, it could go down further and it could go down further. Sure. But then right. sometimes... It just rebounds and then it's too late. You're like, oh, maybe I'll dip right. down again. It never does. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. I don't know how many cards I've lost thinking that, make, yeah. trying to make that strategy work. Right. So, right. but the point is, is that like if if the the main your go type low population card is going down and you think, oh, I think it could go down further and I'll take even mm -hmm. more of Nell. Well, you know what? Whatever you're hanging on to right now is also going to go down even further, and it's not low population, so it has less of a chance to really like. It's already in the negatives. Yeah, Those exactly. <laughs> Can't give them away. Yeah, yeah. No, good, good advice. Um, I got another one. Like, I think with the hobby when I was, you know, really hyped up, everything was selling, even non-sports cards. You sure. know what I mean? Like the non-traditional sports, and I think with the hobby going through what it's going now, those cards are the ones to really tank as well, right? So if you still believe in the hobby and you like some of these more niche plays, you could probably get tremendous, tremendous value on some of these cards, right? right. So like, you know, like I, I haven't been thinking about a lot of non-sports because I'm primarily a sports guy, but um, I've been looking at the 2021 Star Wars Galaxy Chrome, you know what I mean? <laughs> and... Uh, um, and like more specifically, we're just talking about this off air, the Jedi a la Kurosawa, you know, the 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 card with the seven or six or seven Jedis yeah. um, mm -hmm. in the attack Japanese mode art. with the the Japanese yeah. art, the red sun in the background, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think a great curator made it popular by selling his super fractor of that card. Like, you know, that that card raw, the refractor version is going for like 150 bucks right now. Wow. You know what I mean? Like at the hype of the hobby, I could see that going for like 500 or 600 right, right. Um, at the very least. So yeah, like there's some niche plays that you can definitely make too um, at this time because I think they're the ones more heavily discounted. And especially right. if you're like into Star Wars or into some of these other non-sports cards, um, yeah, don't be afraid to make that move. You know, I know like we talk about investing GOAT players, which is a really good strategy, but maybe you don't even have the funds to invest in good GOAT players, right? right? So yeah, look uh, look where there's um, more value, I guess. And right. um, another one I had, and I think I mentioned this in a previous pod as well, like if you like to complete sets or subsets, you know, completing sets is pretty hard because there's so many variations and so the, sub, the checklist is huge, but like subsets, like I just completed one of the home field advantage, top series nice. one yeah. inserts. Um, so I got all 10 and, Sweet. you know, I, I, two of them, I told you I paid at the peak and then I feel better. <laughs> like I, I, you know, dollar average cost down for the other eight. That's true. So you're all so in as a set, is pretty good. <laughs> exactly. And so as a set, yeah, I didn't pay as much, but, um, you know, at the peak again, I could have seen those inserts. These, these are supposed to be case hits. I feel like 
there's a lot for it to be case hits, but yeah. Yeah, that just um, shows I you the print cap, pr- the, the print, print run, yeah, the print run. <laughs> It's probably ridiculous, but it's, yeah. you know the odds of getting those uh, home field advantage cards is like one in two twenty three packs, yeah, two hundred twenty three, right? So you know, back at the peak of the hobby, that that would have had more value. Now it's like forty to fifty bucks each, you right. know? and and like if it rebounds, like I think for me personally, I like this subset specifically because like I feel like this is one of the first you know uh, inserts that Tops has done. And, right. and it actually looks nice, like in terms of the artwork and, you know, although it's a blatant ripoff of the Panini downtown. <laughs> but if you think of like the Panini downtown, when was their first downtown set? You know, oh, like I'm man. sure that's worth something now. I don't even know. You right. know what I mean? Yeah, Maybe yeah, like, yeah. like if you could trace it back. Like that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And there's been a lot since. But if you go to the first set, like I see this top series one home field advantage kind of as like a one of the first insert types that, you know moving forward people will see like oh this was a good set it, it can ins- be wishful thinking on my part but awesome. uh, you know what from a but- hobbyist perspective yeah inserts like rare inserts are so underrated like yeah, so right. underrated like i i wish that in they brought back the love for inserts because as a kid if you got an insert if you got a donruss diamond kings game <laughs> over it's like boom you know <laughs> right. the red set <laughs> I don't even know if there were inserts at the time, but I remember when I pulled like a Diamond King, like it was like hand drawn or whatever, but it was an awesome card. Oh, really? But yeah, yeah. I was, was even red... as a kid, I was into the hype, man. It was like <laughs> Diamond King was trash, but like Todd Van Poppel prospects, I was like, yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Kevin Moss. Yeah. Kevin Moss. Totally. <laughs> Kevin Moss. <laughs> People probably like the younger generation probably like have no clue Kevin Moss is. They're, they're tuning out right now, so let's uh, switch the topic right away. <laughs> <laughs> the the only thing about inserts now, like they just kind of over the modern cards. They've the modern sets. They've kind of like overdone it. You know what I mean? Like yeah, at the card show, Young, we're ripping open your the twenty twenty two Bowman, right. and. I lost count of how many types of inserts there were. Like, I'm like, is this? It's just. I'm like, is this a good insert or like a, or a regular right. insert? You know, what I mean? yeah. Nobody wants them. It's sad. Yeah. It looks kind of cool, but yeah, I have no idea right. which ones are the good ones and which ones aren't. So, yeah. No, and I agree with you 100 about like at this time, you know, you're gonna shake off all the the quick flippers and even from like um, content creation, the influencers, right. like the ones that want to get in and you know, at the hype of the hobby and try to make it big. And now it's a lot more challenging to do for that. Sure. Those guys are right. going to quit creating for content. Sure. 100%. So, for us, you have to have passion. You, know, you have to have passion in what you do. And yeah. that's what, if you don't have passion anymore for the space, you're probably going to leave too. Just, just being real because, because life sure. starts taking a turn. Other things become important. Right. Uh, other things become less important. Right. Especially if you're taking L's all over the place. Right. So <laughs> that's why we yeah. got to change our mindset to more of a long term strategy. And I think that's uh, like like we said, you could never go wrong with buy what you love and stop day trading, day trading it like uh, stocks. Right. Right. So okay. for listeners, if you got anything out of that Refractor Jones episode, this is a guy that's been collecting since 1979. So he, he has yeah. where I was born. No, like nonstop. All of us kind of took a break. We don't know what happened from like 99 to like 2018, but Refractor Jones has been there solid for all of this time. And his one tip, his one like tip or message to everybody was, if you're in it for the long haul, you will not lose guaranteed. That's what he said. Right. right? So he's seen, he's seen all the ups and downs. He's seen when it crashed and in the mid nineties, he saw when sports cars wasn't popular, popular anymore in like 2010 He's seen it all. And he said, if you enter for the long term, you'll always get your return. So it was, it was yeah, it was a great uh, little tip. 100% to take away. agree. Yeah. Shout out to Refractor Jones. And I, that, I'm glad you brought that point up because, like, it reminded me, I put up a post of, a, I think, a LeBron James Refractor rookie card, Topps Chrome rookie card. And you know how much, how, you know, how valuable that card is now, right? Right. right. And remember in the interview, John, like, he was saying he sold that card and yeah. you know like and he's not a big lebron guy like he he shared that with you right <laughs> like both of you guys aren't huge lebron guys but he'll still buy a lebron card you know at a pretty good price and then 
you know, like when the hobby's down, sure, it's a lot more affordable. That's why we're talking about this exact issue right now. Right. And then when the hobby picks up, you know, those GOAT type cards, those rare limited GOAT type cards, like that LeBron James Tops Corner Factor, yeah. just shoots up. And then right. I think uh, Refractor mentioned, like, yeah, I bought it. I was able to buy a home based on the funds that he got from that car. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. so like the opportunities are there for those who are patient, for those who are in it for the long haul. Yeah, 100% agree. And um, I think that includes us too. Like we had talked about this too. Like we love talking about sports cards, even during this bear market. And, right. you know, it's, I'm still I ripping. Know. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I got to stop though. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe bring it down a notch, but yeah. <laughs> Everybody feels my pain. Everybody. <laughs> Young, it's it's like we always say, it's great content, all right? You just got to film it's, yourself doing that. <laughs> worst case scenario, it's great content. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait for that YouTube video to come out. All right. <laughs> okay. I think uh, we've offered some good advice, hopefully. Um, but uh, yeah, let's go on to our next segment that we're simply calling Shout Out. We did this a while ago as well, where we just wanted to give some props to other people in the hobby for their positive contributions. You know, we in the hobby as a whole probably don't do this enough. But last time we did this, I know we gave kudos to guys like Scotty B Cards uh, for his in-depth knowledge on baseball cards. And he actually came on the show a couple of times as a guest, which was really cool, right? So um, I thought we could do that again. Is there anyone else you guys have been following in terms of their content and want other fellow collectors to know about? Yeah, for me, I've been following Pac Man cards uh, for a while. He's been, yeah, he's been, he's good. Yeah, he's been in on YouTube like I think since 2015. So he was kind of pre COVID hobbyist then, and, and yeah. uh, some of his stuff is is still great because you don't see those OG type uh, influencers. I would categorize him as a bigger influencer. I think he has he has over 150,000 subscribers on YouTube now and uh he's genuine to the hobby right so he he's a guy that you know was was front front center in that whole whatnot flawless case where he got invited to LA or I don't, I don't know if it was in LA but like um where a whatnot was holding that whole mm. whole thing and they gave Sasha was there all these other influencers and I don't think he falls into that category of just straight up influencer. He's been kind of just trying to help and create content. Like yeah. I remember for me, it was always like I want to rip a box of a certain brand like a prism and see what it's like. And he would always do his reviews and what he liked about, you know, uh, the sets and go in depth knowledge. Right. So I kind of, mm -hmm. um, you know, respect kind of like what he's doing and how he handles kind of like all the, I guess, the negativity that comes across the hobby, especially being in that space of influencer type people. Uh, so I think he, he's a, he's a really good, um, you know, uh, uh, account to follow just because he talks about relevant things, you know, and it's more hobby focused than anything. It's not necessarily about, you know, flipping always and stuff like that. He's going deep into sets and, and mm. uh, doing reviews as well. So yeah, he has a YouTube channel. He has Instagram that he's uh, pretty active on as well. So for me, uh, I, I totally give a shout out to Pac-Man cards. Um, yeah. yeah. Good choice. Yeah, no, I like, like I think he was one of the first guys I like just saw yeah. his YouTube channel. Like just, oh, you know, it's very was basic like, at the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it was so yeah, cap yet yeah, captivating. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Oh, what, what's he going to hit? You know, right. like one of the first guys to really do that for sure. Yeah. I got to, I'm going to go back and shout out my original shout out, which is the great curator. He mm -hmm. started off when I first started watching his channels. Um, it was a channel that helped a lot of newbies and he would go, tips and tricks and you know things about the hobby that he liked um when you go to a show here's some tips to to take on uh he was more of like a educational uh youtuber and he started off pretty small um but he's very active so he started vlogging all of his he goes to like a ton of car shows all over the united states and he also came to the toronto expo recently um and he con he f films that content so i think from there he starts to get bigger uh, and he was, uh, you can tell from the stuff like in the background and in his house, he's very much into like 
comic books and pop culture and most of his stuff early on was sports cards but i think he started to settle and obviously back then he was also trying to within the hobby space he's trying to make money too to make a living here um but now that pop culture relevant cards Mm -hmm. you can make money on it he i think he's kind of found his groove so he's like really into pmgs star wars marvel you name it i think he's kind of fell into that groove and there aren't many youtubers that kind of focus on those areas so i think he's found a little bit of a niche so he's he's i think he's doing he's doing great he's kind of i feel like he's been taking some heat about the kurosawa super fractor because he's like supposedly like pumping and dumping with a whole bunch of the other guy which is my opinion it's a bit of nonsense but um which is too bad but hey you know when you when you're when you make it you know when you get haters that means you made it right so that's when you know yeah yeah so kudos (laughs) kudos to a great curator it's a it's a good uh you know it's a a good shout out for him and then number two for me uh, i've been watching this guy for a while uh, as well is a northeast ohio sports and comics i think that's his name uh it comes comes out as like neo sports and comics um he's kind of like what jeff wilson used to do originally when he first started he he actually uses the market movers tool and talks mm. about what's going on in the market. Let's look at some key key cards. So he does a lot of analysis, and then whenever some big you know news that comes out like like we talked about today, like eBay launches Vault Service or PSC right. dropping their prices, things like that, he'll he'll make a cha- he'll make an episode talking about it uh, and his opinions about it. I find them to be pretty um, intelligent. In the way he okay. in the way he comes across, and, not and, like us, and, not, <laughs> not like us. Yeah, a bunch of very values. different from us. Yeah, that's, that's that's cool. No, I I just like I just like the way he how he forms his opinions. They're well thought out. Uh, again, he articulates his points really well. So he, he's a good listen. Yeah, yeah. He's a good listen. So if anyone nice. northeast northeast Ohio, uh, comic books and sports cards, um, give him a chance. Cool. Yeah, we'll post all their handles in our um, show bio. Uh, episode bio below so you can find them easily uh, my one shout out is a uh, guy on instagram i found recently his handle is king of the cards cards with a k and i think he was at the toronto sport card expo as he well was, yeah but um he started doing like these uh, kind of joke kind of um videos you know almost like tiktok like you know um and uh, that got my attention. But then he did this like $1 sports car challenge where he just started with the dollar oh, and then yeah. just built his way up. And it's kind of cool. Like, I think he got up to a few thousand dollar wow. card value. Yeah. Right. So, and it's just hustling. And, you know, you know, you like to see guys like that, like make those moves, how they made the moves, you know, and um, how it's possible. You know, it's, it is a lot of work, right? Especially at the beginning. Right. And, uh, Sure. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's doable, right? Yeah. And um, I think that was pretty engaging, just how far he got. I don't know if he's still on it, um, but yeah, it was it was crazy. Every time I check back on my Instagram feed, it's like, holy, he has a autograph of this guy, two autograph cards now, <laughs> you know, starting with the, do- the dollar um, way at the beginning. So yeah. shout out to King of the Cards. And I was going to mention Great Curator as well, but I don't have to because you did, John. Um, but yeah, I like how he addresses trolls now too, you know, like just trying to keep the space positive as much as possible. And, um, yeah, that's what we want to see as well. Right. So if you never heard of these guys, yeah, definitely give them a follow and check them out. Um, there's a lot of good content creators and influencers, influencers in the hobby. And I know we have a tendency to focus on the ones that are more controversial, but, um, hopefully we can do more of this in future episodes as well. All right, with that, let's finish off this episode with our weekly segment we call Pick One. All right, and this is where we put up two cards or sets and uh, we debate which one we would rather invest in. Okay, so Hyung, as usual, do you want to start things off? I'll lead off, um, and I know uh, this this is kind of pertaining to you, Clark, because you made a move on this, so I know there might be mm-hmm. a bias for you, but <laughs> okay. I want you to, you know... Just feel it out. Just wait until I pull yeah. this. So it's a 2013 Bowman Chrome Aaron Judge Refractor Auto BGS 95, which, which is some, which yeah. which you picked up at the show. This is why I said you're going to be biased about this. <laughs> <laughs> so the last sold it was um, 
pretty low at 1800 us um yeah. versus a 2014 bowman chrome first of mookie betts refractor auto that's number to 500 um a bgs 95 sold for 1900 which one are yeah. you guys buying between the two they kind of entered the league in, in kind of like the same time frame so uh both are on trajectory in my opinion if if judge plays keeps on playing the way he's doing i'm telling you he's gonna break some some records for sure um mm-hmm. just because i know he's he's a little older and that concerns a lot of people but i'm telling you at this rate He'll he'll be over 500 home runs, uh, in my opinion. And if he's a lifer for New York, his you know value might you know skyrocket as well, just just based on the the history of New York, right? So, and obviously yeah. Mookie's Mookie, he might uh, you know turn some heads this year with a, a potential MVP run. But you know, I think um, I think his cards are still undervalued, um, mm-hmm. especially. I will say, sorry, I know this is a, a pick one, but his Bowman Chrome first base. At 150 bucks is a steal in my opinion, but anyways, wow. Between the two, which one are you guys picking? I Johnny, am, you go first. Oh uh, yeah, I will definitely go first. I am not gonna quite jump on the Aaron Judge hype train quite yet. Um, I think if you're a flipper between these two right now, the Aaron Judge move is tantalizing i think there is a great chance that that card can double by the end of the year and clearly clark essentially why you made this move right Mm -hmm. plus Mm -hmm. you also you know you've mentioned a lot like you actually like aaron judge um so even as a collector you kind of get to enjoy both so i get it um but we just talked about getting out of your base getting out of your high population cards and putting it into goat type players I don't put Aaron Judge quite yet in that category. I still think he's a bit inconsistent year to year to be on that level. But a guy like Mookie Betts, he's just too consistent. He's showing another MVP run type season. Uh, and his value is pretty low for who he is mm-hmm. as a player and what he means in base, the game of baseball. Um, so I think when I when, when we talked about that, like moving away and putting a goat, st- goat type, I got to stick true to... The strategy that I'm holding right now. So if it was me and I'm spending the money, I'm putting it into the Mookie bets. Yep, makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. Um, man, th- this is yeah catered to me <laughs> because <laughs> you know my history. Like I don't know if you you guys heard me up with my Mookie bets first Bowman Chrome base auto card that I had BGS nine five, right. and I bought it for thirty dollars, which is insane. <laughs> oh my God. And then I, I flipped it for sixty dollars, you know, and and now look where it is now. So you know, we talked about this before too. Like, I just can't get back into it because I did that, you know, like, right. you know. So um, but but on the other hand, I had a chance to get a Aaron Judge base uh, first Bowman Chrome BGS nine five for ninety nine dollars. Wow. And I was thinking about it, and I never pulled the trigger, you know, and <laughs> and so like those both those cards have. You know, yeah, stories attached to it for me. <laughs> um, but if I was going to get in, back into it like I did with Aaron Judge, um, I would get into a better card. So, like, this is kind of a different scenario. Yeah, like, I would actually consider more getting a Mookie Betts Refractor rather than going back to the base card that I used to have, you know? Right. It makes me feel like, oh, it's something different. <laughs> but um, but I, I think you kind of mentioned it. I think the short to midterm flip of Aaron judge is very tantalizing for sure. Mm. Just the scenario, just if things break right. And I think we mentioned it either earlier in this episode or the one before it, where if he hits 60 plus home runs this season, he plays for the Yankees. If he breaks Roger Maris's, who was another Yankee, his record, the narrative is there for the hobby to just pick up on for sports writers to pick up on. Right. And I think that will just inflate the price of his autograph rookie cards. And I think Mookie Betts is more of a longer term play. Like you said, if you consider him a GOAT player, yeah, you got to have to wait a while to see his true value of that card, right. you know, over a longer period. And I have no doubt, I love, we talked about Mookie too. We love, especially with Scotty B, right? Like we all love Mookie and think his, think he's terribly undervalued. But um, right now, yeah, if, if I was given the option, like you're this one, one V one, 
Will, will I trade my Aaron Judge refractor card that I have now for a Mookie Betts? Ooh, that's a good card? one. Yeah. No. Uh, no, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm not doing it. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense though. Yeah, I yeah. like it. Yeah. So I'm I'm going with Aaron Judge on this one. You know what? That's uh, you guys summed it up perfectly. I think it's it's kind of like the short term play could be like an Aaron Judge based off I me mean, if he hits over sixty one. That's a big statement for Aaron Judge in a New York mm-hmm. Yankee uniform. A lot of history there. Right. right. So especially on a down season where, you know, people claim that the balls aren't juiced as right. as much, you know, you could see as you could see a lot of numbers are down this year from a hitting perspective. But um uh yeah, I think there's there's tremendous uh upside to that. But for me it's 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 Mookie Betts hands down. Just I'm looking more long term play, um, what this more safer investment would be. Just I just look at Mookie's numbers and his his year to year, um, his career war at fifty three. You know, he's probably gonna double that before he's he's done. And if he's in the hundreds, like that's elite, elite class of, you know, Hall of Famers. Um and he's on that trajectory, right? And, you know, he had a he had I'd say one bad season, which was his worst season last year, but he still hit two sixty four with twenty three um home runs and was an all-star at the end of the day right and that's one of his worst seasons and you know he's a career 300 average hitter and a potentially 500 home run type caliber player whether he reaches 500 that might be a little stretch but i think i think he has uh, he has tremendous upside just based on his age and kind of um you know his trajectory his hall of fame trajectory and where he's at so for for that price i think he's still by like i said um I think it was uh, right before this. His Bowman first Chrome base PSA ten is selling for a hundred fifty bucks, which is insane considering your Julio Rodriguez, your Bobby Witt Juniors, your Spencer Torkelson, you know, even Acuna, T- Tatis, all them. They're they're more expensive almost uh, in in some instances than a Mookie Betts first Chrome, right? And as you like, I said, print runs were different uh, back then, and a lot of people. Uh, uh, weren't in it for the flip so a lot of these higher end color cards that you don't see you go on ebay it's hard to find like uh even i was looking at aaron judge like a good bowman crow auto. it's tough just because mm-hmm. it's eight years away nine years ago that you know the card surfaced and uh compared to like the 2019s and 2020s you see people just okay i want to just flip it now right but right. as years go by these cards are getting really really tough to you know right. find mm-hmm. not a lot of people are selling them anymore right so yeah. um they all yeah, eventually I, I, land in collect hardcore collectors hands right and yeah and and, and it, they're similar mindset as what i'm talking about it's like okay when you get that kind of grail card of you know aaron judge or mookie bets that you want you kind of lock in the safe and kind of look at it as a long-term investment right and that's nine years nine years ago right so you could kind of draw parallels to future markets as well on on these current superstars right so but for me it's going to be Mookie Betts um uh just because I I just believe in him long term but I do like to play Clark I I I will say I want to see Judge hit like 70 this year I hope he does because it it will it'll it'll, it'll bring some kind of spark to to the baseball yeah. that's needed because get you're people excited for sure. Yeah, because you're missing out on, you know, Tatis and Soto, um uh, even Acuña, like the the guys that are supposed to be the Vladdy, all four mm-hmm. guys are the the hype of baseball. You don't have it right now, right? So, yeah, I'm hoping Judge does something something stupid like that. No, I'm hoping for I'm rooting for both having something. <laughs> you know, they're, you know, like yeah, those guys you just mentioned, the young talents that we all believe in still. Um, like you said, like hitting is down, right? Like they're batting 250, 260, the guys that right. are playing. But, um, you know, Judge is batting 315 right now. Mookie's right. batting 302. So, yeah, you want to see those kind of players do well. And just, For sure. uh, yeah, it'll be exciting to watch. Mm-hmm. So that's a good one. Johnny, you got yours? Hi, boys. So we touched on this a little bit um, this episode. Better investment over the next 6 to 12 months. Sports cards? Or non-sports cards. We're talking pop culture cards, Pokemon, Marvel, oh, Star man. Wars, Pop Century, whatever you want to name it. Sports cards or non-sports cards. Six months, eh? Six, six, to, six 12, to 12 months? Six to 12 months. Mm. That's tough. Short term. Mm. I think, I know I said before <laughs> earlier in the segment, like there's tremendous value in non-sports cards. Um but that being said, I think it also takes a bit longer for those cards to rebound in terms of value. 
right? So right. I think you get, generally speaking, non-sports cards for cheaper than, you know, uh, sports cards. But when it rebounds, some of the cheaper sports cards that you believe in will rebound faster and um, be valued more quickly on the upper level. So, so yeah, I think, now I'm trying to, now I'm thinking different, but yeah, no, I think. <laughs> Changes like, do, mind, huh? do I really believe that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sticking with sports cards. I think sports cards will rebound faster than non-sports cards, although you could get non-sports cards at better value right now, <laughs> if that makes sense. Makes sense. All right. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to agree with Clark here too just because I think I think with baseball for instance you have um you know releases. I think releases are important to the hobby uh with you know um prospecting and as well as the up and coming stars in 2022 like um Topps Chrome you know, for Wander, Julio, Bobby Witt Jr. Um, and I I feel like there's a lot more daily activity that allows the sports card market to kind of feel that bump based off kind of like um, every day, you know, what's happening in the sports world, right? Whereas um, pop culture cards, I just feel like there's there's not a lot of people in that game as well. So I don't think in the six, six to 12 months period, I believe there will be a lot of buying opportunities that may spark the pop culture, sport, non-sports card market, uh, like Marvel, Star Wars and, and whatnot. But overall, I just think there's too many uh, factors that make the card market move that you'll still see, um, I guess, a better investment in that part, like I, I tie Las Las Vegas into this as well. Like, I mean, if we were mm, betting right. Las Vegas Pokemon, you know, like putting money on Pokemon <laughs> and stuff like that, I think it would be different. But reality is, you know, sports sports betting is huge and massive, and True. it it goes hand in hand with the sports card market ripping and all that jazz, right? So I think there's a lot more fundamentals to go with the sports card market. So I'll, I'm going to just stick with that, with what I know. Hey, but you know what? Maybe maybe there's a, a surge in, in, in pop culture you know, cards. I, I, I see it here and there. It's a niche market, but I could see it picking up as well. Mm-hmm. I don't know what I was thinking. I think, I, I think I've asked a question like this before, number one. <laughs> Number two, I don't know what I was thinking because I'm asking a bunch of sports card guys about <laughs> pop culture cards. We are not certified <laughs> to give any sort of opinion on pop culture cards. So clearly it was probably bound to be a sweep. Um, but you know what? I am going to I'm going to give my opinion on both. Uh, I think sports cards long term, to me, I mean, we know it the best. So I, I've, we're biased. I think it's going to be the winner. I honestly think vintage sports cards is going to save um, sports cards, even in the short run, because mm. I think sports cards, there's a lot of negativity around for the short term around, especially ultra modern, right? We're talking select prism overprinting, all of these other brands that Lux and this and that, that people are like, you, you guys are just trying to take us for a run. So there's a bit of a negative image right now on the modern game. And I think that's going to really affect sports cards overall in all people's eyes, right? Investors, flippers, hobbyists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I do think low pop, goats, vintage is really going to save sports cards in the short run and the long run. Um, but I am going to say, you know, I'm just going to take a chance here. Like clearly we <laughs> all thought we we're going to pick sports cards, but let me go the other way and be one to make a bit of a point about pop culture. And, you know, Marvel, Pokemon, Star Wars, Pop Century, things like that. They, there's no conversation about overprinting and anything that really too negative, right? So I think as more Marvel movies come out, I think there's like another Thor movie coming out and a couple of others. Mm-hmm. Um, Star Wars is has a huge, kind of like F1, right? Star Wars has a huge untapped market that may hope may connect with this card world right they're all into 
you know, paraphernalia and toys and all that stuff. But if you can connect that world into cards, who knows what could happen? Um, Pop Century, I don't know what fanatics would eventually do with maybe movie cards. But if they made like still images of like iconic movie moments, you know, I don't know what it's going to cost to get those images. But that would be pretty awesome to have super fractures of like really iconic images of 80s movies, 90s movies, etc. as we go forward. Um, So I think because pop culture doesn't really fall victim to like this negativity about overprinting and prism and these guys being greedy and all of that jazz. I think in the very short term, as people are trying to scrounge their way and trying to find and salvage their investment and and look into what's the next hottest thing. I think there's a chance that in the short term, non-sports cards could do better than sports cards. So I'll, I'm I'm gonna fifty one to forty nine pick the other side. <laughs> <All right. laughs> and again, I am not certified to give any sort of opinion on non-sports cards. So take that for what it is. You just wanted to save your one v one. I 100 percent just <laughs> wanted to save my one v one. That's cool. All right. <laughs> okay, we'll end off this pick one segment with my pairs of cards. The first one is the Patrick Mahomes Optic Hollow PSA 10. Johnny, you and I have been wanting one yes. for a long time. Last sold for $1,900. Holy. Yeah, US. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when we were like 3000 That is a oh, good Oh, yeah, I got to buy it. That's a good buy deal. It right now. If it, if it just dips below 3000 and then we kind of forgot about it, it's 1900 last sold. Oh, wow. I think I saw one at the expo for... 5,000 Canadian. So yeah, you, you we're talking about how dealers are overpricing. Right. <laughs> but then yeah. the when I saw that card like in person, it's a beauty. Like it, the shine so off nice. of it. Yeah, I love it. So um anyway, that's on one side 1900 or a Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert field level silver PSA 10 you get both and they're both going for about 950 each. So 1900 combined. So you got fair value there. So what are you going for? One Mahomes Oof. Optic Hollow PSA 10 or Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert Field Level Select um, Silver PSA 10? I'm going to go with the 2017. I guess it would be 2017 Optic yeah. uh, Hollow Mahomes. Mahomes just because, one, there's a lot of speculation uh, and inflated price on Herbert and Burrow. But we know that market. We we do the same thing with young superstars in 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 other sports as well. Uh, but I just feel from a more like um, I guess uh, hobbyist perspective, I feel like select in in that year select from 2019 and previous. I feel like there's a lot more value. I feel like the field levels and the court sides in 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 the in the 2020 plus. I feel like um, they they've printed so many parallels that it loses its luster, kind of, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I uh, and the Mahomes, like you got, like you guys said, it's it's such a beautiful card, especially optic football. Um, you know, with the rated rookie logo and you know the the pose, the optic pose, is such a classic card. And I think in in 2017, we're dealing with way lower print runs than you know, than modern times. And like I said, you're, you're banking on two uh, young stars to, you know, keep up, you know, that, that play. Right. And I, I, I find, you know, markets will eventually correct itself both ways. Right. So I think Mahomes has, has the resume and he's not done. Um, I believe, you know, he still has a lot in him. So I, I'm going to go Mahomes, even though his price might, (laughs) <laughs> even dip even more but uh yeah i think the the supply demand um in terms of the population of the silver optic hollow is i guess it would just be an optic hollow and not not a silver but optic hollow is way uh lower than i guess the others well let me give you the pop count actually it's might surprise you and i don't know if this will change your mind but um the optic hollow psa 10 pop count for Mahomes is about 649 so 650 okay mm-hmm. Uh, and then you, Justin Herbert's field level silver PSA 10, the pop count's 218. Right. Joe Burrow field level silver PSA 10 is 340. Yeah. So, yeah, for me, that's, uh, I don't think that changes anything just because okay. for me, I'm used to like, uh, courtside silvers, um, field level silvers pre 20, 
20, right. they should be way lower, lower. you know, way, uh, way, way yeah, lower. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, so it, beco- it becomes a lot more common. So that's, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. So you picked Mahomes. Okay. So for me, thing, two things that are going for each of these, Mahomes, number one, is Mahomes. He's won a Super Bowl. He's on a Hall of Fame trajectory. Um, he's established. On the other side, you've got Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert. What's going for them? Obviously, young, studly quarterbacks, lots of hype. And you have, in the, especially in the short term, you've got that volatility where the cards could double, triple, right? Mm-hmm. The things not going for it is Mahomes' prices have been correcting, obviously. I think his prices had already baked in like two or three Super Bowl rings in the next five years, which is yeah. not happening. So it's starting to correct. And we could right. see that price possibly go down even more. Let's say Mahomes and the Chiefs don't come out to a flying start. Um, and on the flip side, exact like Young, you stole my words exactly. I was thinking of saying select is kind of the, the super, super ultra modern select is kind of losing its luster. And I 100% agree. I don't trust select as a brand and the image and the... <clears throat> The pain, you know, the, the hurt that the image, the brand has taken, especially in 2020 and up. Um, I don't know what it's going to take to rebound it, but to me, even for me, when I look at field level and courtside, it's just not special. I know that you can tell by the amount of them getting pulled from blasters and blister packs. You can tell that there's a there's a high population count, so it just doesn't seem as as special as before. So I don't trust the select brand. Um, so as much as Mahomes, I think could maybe go down more. It's 2017 overall. It was pre 2018, which was where pop counts really start to explode. So Mahomes is right before that classic image, hollow, you know, again, going after go, go type players. I think it's a lot safer and the card has taken a hit. And I think at 1500, 1600 bucks, you know, if it goes to that or lower, <laughs> there is going to be a lot of support at those prices. And you, Clark, you and I will be one of those people that is going to support that price. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm picking Mahomes. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm, I won't be labor the point. I'm, it's going to be a Mahomes sweep. I thought I could get you with two stud QB, young stud QBs, <laughs> field level silvers. But um, yeah, I'm glad you made the point about select, especially the later uh additions or sets uh with their pop count because i was going to make that point as well but um and the other thing was i don't know if it would have gotten you but yeah the mahomes optic hollow has definitely seen a bigger dip than the other two cards that we mentioned so that might scare some people off right but um it's what we were talking about before it's like oh we would have bought it at sub three and now we're looking at (laughs) sub two you're like uh should we just wait or should we just get it now (laughs) and then it's gonna go back up to three when the season starts you know so so we'll see um now that i'm reminded of like now that i just checked it recently and saw how low it is i'm like gotta put that back on my watch list again so so we'll see all right yeah that's the show for this week we appreciate as always our listeners and our subscribers if you can give us five stars if you enjoyed the episode or if you enjoy our podcast in general, that will be much appreciated. And uh, yeah, we will see you again next week. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening to Cards to the Moon. We'd really appreciate you subscribing to our podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And you can also connect with each of us on Instagram at 5 Card Guys, or you can follow Hyung at Integrity Sports Cards or John at Trade You at Recess. You can also check us out at fivecartguys.com. Thanks again, and hope to connect soon.